in order to achieve a good outcome, they need to have a strong government with a mandate, with a clear mandate, and with the capacity to get a new agreement through the parliament. So, Frederick, Brexit negotiations were due to start next week. However, in light of the unexpected results from the general snap election in the UK, is a hung parliament bad news for Brexit negotiations? Yes, I think it is bad news for Brexit negotiations. I think it's bad news for the UK and the UK government in the sense that when you look at the parliament now, I think it's difficult to see any type of outcome getting a majority in the parliament. So we have, on the one hand, sort of the hard Brexiteers, those that want to leave uh, with a clean exit, sort of leaving not just the EU, but the single market, the customs union, and virtually everything associated with having to be under the sovereignty of the European Court of Justice. Um, inside the Tory party, inside the Conservative party, that's a very strongly held view, but but they don't have a majority anymore. And they are most likely not going to be able to count on the Labour Party in order to get that hard Brexit through. Because even if the Labour Party went uh, out to voters in this campaign with a message that they also wanted to leave the single market and also wanted to leave the customs union, they also know that a lot of centrists voted for Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party because they wanted to send a message to uh, Theresa May and the Conservatives that they can't just go for the hardest of possible Brexits because uh, the UK is a divided country. Uh, in the referendum, it was 52% in favour of leaving and 48% in favour of staying. And that's not the type of uh, result that gives you a very strong mandate. So I'd say this is a very difficult situation from the viewpoint of the UK government. But I think it's a difficult also for the EU because at the end of the day, what they want to achieve is a successful outcome in the sense of both trying to sort out the type of exit issues on uh, what has been labeled the Brexit bill. Uh, on settling on an arrangement for how citizens uh, living in the UK or Brits living in the Europe, how uh, the rights for them are going to be in the future. And then, of course, the EU also wants to negotiate an agreement for the future, the type of agreement that is going to manage and regulate relations between the EU and the UK after uh, Britain has left. And in order to achieve a good outcome, they need to have a strong government with a mandate, with a clear mandate, and with the capacity to get a new agreement through the parliament. And I think this is what we've seen over the past couple of days since the election in Britain, that most people in Brussels, and I suppose in most capitals around Europe, are scratching their head and just trying to figure out what type of negotiations will at all be possible with a government that may not be able to actually get a mandate for the type of agreement that they're going to negotiate between each other. And you've made a really interesting point there because 2019 is looming very closely and it does seem like the UK is running out of time a little bit. Now, what is the risk that the UK either leaves the European Union with no Brexit deals or actually bad Brexit deals? Well, I'd, I'd say, at least from my point of view, that timing is probably not the critical issue right now. I think if and sort of when we're getting closer to March 2019, if negotiations are on a good track, if the UK government has decided what type of agreement they want to have with the EU, and if, if the EU is okay with that, then I don't think it's going to be a problem to extend the deadline for the negotiations because at the end of the day, all EU countries want to have a good cooperative agreement with the UK. I think the, the the problem is far more about substance and about getting to a point where it's perfectly obvious to everyone what type of agreement that they're going to negotiate. And if that's not there, it's also going to be difficult to negotiate all the other type of issues. We have this sequence now, which is mostly 
laid down by EU leaders themselves, which says that first, we're going to negotiate about money and citizens' rights and a host of other things. And until there has been sufficient progression in those negotiations, which basically suggest that they are about to clinch a deal between each other. But until that point in time, there won't be any type of negotiations about the future trade agreement between the EU and the UK. But a UK government that doesn't have a mandate, uh, doesn't have an idea what type of future trade agreement it wants, probably will clash into EU leaders' right ahead when they begin to talk about money because as in all divorces money is going to be one of the critical sticking points and we may come to a situation where this entire process needs to end up in court um, because that's the only way they're going to figure out a settlement between each other that both can live with. Fantastic well Frederick thank you so much for joining us on the line to provide your insights. That's all from us here in the Geneva studios, but we want to hear how you found this interview, so please do like and comment on dukascoffee.tv.